I didn't usually go to meat markets, but I was with a friend who wanted to celebrate a divorce. This made me remember mine. It was a petty, bitter situation that turned into a fight pretty quickly. She cheated, she got caught, and she didn't want to be held responsible. When her lawyer told her there was no chance of the prenuptial agreement being overturned, she threw an epic tantrum. I still have a recording of it on an old phone that I purposely saved, and I listened to it on my divorce anniversary to remind myself that I made the right decision. There was no celebration for my divorce. Divorce was an admission of failure, broken promises, and I didn't celebrate failure. I noticed that there were a lot of mature women in the club, and suddenly I realized that Rex was hunting cougars. It didn't matter because we were here. He just turned 40, and I just turned 44. Sometimes I felt 90. An active lifestyle and a passion for the gym kept me in great shape, but in the mornings when I got out of bed, I cracked and popped. My doctor once told me that I may be 44, but I have the body of a 30-year-old. In the mornings my back said that this was not entirely true. Well, I'm not in a position to judge, so I tried to have fun. I danced a lot, and some of the women I danced with must have been in their 60s, but they almost wore me out. One very hot woman told me she was 67 and then smiled. I could show you something, darling, that would rock your world. I had no doubt that she was right, and while I was trying to figure out how to sneak away, Rex, drunk and happy, came up to us, smiling like crazy. Who is this beauty? Very soon they were dancing cheek to cheek. They disappeared within 20 minutes, and I didn't see him again until Monday. Having decided that I had enough fun for the night, I headed towards the exit. And then she came in. Her fiery red hair almost reached her waist. Her skirt was so short that if it moved incorrectly, it would have been a wardrobe malfunction. The white silk blouse was unbuttoned to the point that it was obvious she wasn't wearing a bra. Her face was round, with a cute nose and killer blue eyes. This woman was exactly what I was looking for if I was looking for sex without commitment. Unfortunately, she did not arouse any interest in me. The mercenary look on her face confirmed my opinion. She looked around the club as if it were a buffet, trying to find the perfect piece. Her eyes swept over me and then returned for a second look. I was sure that I was on her list. But the woman she was with was a completely different matter. She exuded an understated elegance, her clothes, her accessories, the style of her platinum hair did not scream money. They said she had them, and it wasn't worth talking about. She was perfect in the quietest way. It was also obvious that this was not her natural habitat. She didn't look uncomfortable, but rather more unimpressed. She sipped one martini while her friend had three drinks between dance partners. Several men, young men, asked her to dance, but she refused with a haughty look. She intrigued me, so I walked over while a slow waltz was playing. Can I invite you to this dance? She looked me over, assessing me, dismissing me with her eyes. I'm 51. Congratulations. Will this stop you from dancing? If your partner is over 30. Well then, perhaps we should find one here and warn him not to ask. I'm much closer to your age than you think, and I'm certainly well past 30. Have a nice evening, madam. I was already halfway across the hall when I felt her hand. Sorry. Obviously I don't want to be here, but I am here. I might as well dance with a handsome man and make the best of it, if you still want. She was light as a feather and a very good dancer. I commented on this, and she smiled with a hint of sadness. My husband and I took dance lessons as a way to keep fit. I enjoyed it, but not as much as he did, especially when he started doing the horizontal mambo with one of the instructors. The girl was 25, and she latched on to him. We got divorced, so he can marry her. That must have hurt. Oh yes, at first. But on the other hand, we had a very successful business, and we didn't have a prenuptial agreement, so I ended up owning half, plus our investment grew well. She drained it in three years, and I ended up buying his share of the business so he could pay her. He's still president because he has a good head for business, but he's terribly annoyed that he has to answer to me. I'm sure if he had the chance to do it all over again, 
he would never sign up for these lessons. By this point, we had already moved away from the dance floor and found a quiet corner. I smiled. So, you're beautiful, rich, own a business. Why isn't there another Mr. Angela? She winced. There were several candidates for this position. Unfortunately, their qualifications did not meet my standards. What about you? Now it was my turn to wince. She got a better offer from someone very similar to your ex. I don't think this is the perfect life she wanted. Rumor has it, he made her sign a pretty rigid prenup and is watching her like a hawk. After what she did to me, he should know that under certain circumstances she would not hesitate to do this to him. Is there a little beauty out there somewhere practicing spelling Mrs. Reggie? There was one two years ago. Let's just say our life goals were different and we didn't part on the best terms. Love sucks. Personally, I think love is a great feeling if you're with the right person. I raised my glass. For love when it's real. She raised hers. For knowing when it's right. We talked for another hour. I was surprised how quickly the time passed. I looked behind her and smiled. It seems your friend has found some guys in their thirties. Her smile faded as she watched her friend approach. She hesitated when she saw me, but continued to smile. Look who I found, Angie. I brought you one, but it looks like you already have a stallion. I think I'll keep both of them. See you tomorrow. She looked over her shoulder as they walked away. Maybe. Angela looked disappointed. It hit her hard when her husband left her. She had breast augmentation surgery and removed some wrinkles, hoping to get him back. He wanted nothing to do with her, and now she's on a path of self-destruction trying to prove she's an attractive woman. Lately, she's only attracted to parasites who take advantage of free sex and her bank account. I hope she comes to her senses. She's a really good woman and very attractive for her age. We have three other close friends in our circle. We're all friends from college, and we take turns trying to look after her and protect her until she comes to her senses. I'm starting to lose hope. I have no doubt that one day she will wake up with a terrible hangover, in bed with a man 25 or 30 years younger, trying to remember his name, and this realization will come to her. I'm too old to be that stupid. Then she will begin to return to normal life. You always need to remember that first of all you need to make yourself happy, and she is clearly not happy. Her face gradually lit up. Thank you, Reggie, for this great advice. I think in the near future I will care more about my happiness than the happiness of others. Her phone rang, and she checked it. My car is already here. Can you walk me to the exit? I took her arm, we were walking, and she suddenly started giggling. What? Don't look back, but those platinum bitches are staring at me. Why are they doing this? Because they think I've won the grand prize. You, you're the most handsome, fit man here. Plus, they think, like I do, that you're no older than 30. They think I'm going to take you away for a night of passion where you'll have sex with me hard. The next day I won't be able to walk, and you'll jump out of bed ready to run a marathon. Then you'll look at me, and we'll start again. I smiled. I vote for this plan. Not in this life, dear. I'm afraid you could really do some harm. We approached her car. I think, dear Angie, that you underestimate yourself. I have a feeling that you would be like a volcano, ready to erupt at any moment and destroy everyone in front of you. I think that would be a good way to die. Good night, Angela. It was a pleasure to meet a woman of your level. I was about to kiss her on the cheek but she grabbed my head and gave me a full kiss, then backed away, blushing. Then she smiled. Seismic shifts, dear. Don't get too close. I'm too close, I said. The driver of the car looked at us and smiled. I need to leave. No, you need to deliver this treasure to her vault. Good night, Angela. She was still trying to formulate the words when I closed the door, and he sped up. Three weeks have passed. I thought about the blonde goddess a couple of times before it registered in my memory as a treasured moment. Rex had a hard time looking me in the eyes until I told him what happens in the cougar cave stays in the cougar cave. 
Then he relaxed and smiled. She almost killed me. The woman couldn't get enough. Then she passed out for ten hours. I was starting to worry, but she woke up, looked at the time and rushed into the shower. She looked back and asked if I would go with her. She said that we don't have time for sex because she was almost late for a family event. When we finished, she showed me pictures of her grandchildren, saying that she would have four of them for the day. I asked about meeting again, and she smiled. I doubt it. I'm too old to limit my impressions and don't usually do repeats. You're a good lover, dear, but you're just one in a long line of good lovers. Thanks for the night. So the cougar chewed you up like a piece of meat and is now ready to hunt again? That's pretty cold. Rex simply smiled. There's a lot of cougars out there, buddy, ready to hunt again. Rumor has it you're off with one really hot granny. I didn't leave with her. We just went out together. And honestly, she was a lot hotter than I expected in a place like this. You're lost, dude. You should have had sex with her. Dude, what are you, 16 years old? Maybe you really need to spend time with older ladies. Maybe they can help you grow up. Will never happen. I tried to be a responsible adult with my wife. We all remember how that ended. I'll never take a woman seriously again. You'll be married again in two years. I bet I won't. If you win, I'll throw you a party. If I win, you should hand me a beer and tell me how right I am. You have an annoying habit of being right, but not this time. This case will be the sweetest beer I've ever drunk. Rex walked away laughing and I smiled. Wait and see. Two weeks later I met him for tennis, and he smiled like the cat that ate the canary. What happened to you? Nothing. I just made some money unexpectedly over the weekend, and it cheered me up. We played to serve. He was younger and faster, but he spent too many nights in bars while I spent them at the gym. Preparation trumped talent, and I beat him in straight sets. My knee told me how expensive this victory was when we finished. We were drying off before taking a shower when his smile returned. Remember that extra money I was talking about? I made it from you. On me? What did I do? You made a serious impression on the beautiful grandma. She came to the club looking for you. When she was told that I knew how to find you, she grabbed me. I thought I would be lucky, but she quickly brushed it off. She offered me a deal. I'll give you $200 if you tell me how to contact Reggie. Best of all, give him this card and tell him to call me. I want to talk to him. Dude, I thought it would be funny, so I asked her if she was pregnant. Word of wisdom, don't piss her off. Her slap still hurts my jaw a little. Anyway, I swore to her on all things holy that I would give you a message and her card. Here. When I was at home, I looked at the card. It was her business card, Angela Bassett, CEO of Bassett Enterprises, and on the back was her cell phone number. It was only 7.30, so I called. Hello? She sounded a little cautious, and I realized that she didn't recognize the number. Hi, is this Angela Bassett, who was voted the hottest grandma in the state two years in a row? This is Reggie Wilkes. There was humor in her voice. The same Reggie Wilkes who is considered the successor to Dorian Gray. How old do you look now? 33, 30. I'm old enough to look damn good with you on my arm. How's it going, Angie? I hear you've put a bounty on me. A little. I really wanted to know how long it would take to get you to my door, but after thinking about it, I decided to try it the old-fashioned way. What are you doing next Saturday? I have no urgent social obligations. Great. My company is holding an awards ceremony, and as a big shot, I have to be there. My ex is bringing his new girlfriend, and I want to outdo him. So you're going to use me? How self-serving, Angie. Let me put it to you this way. You'll come with me to this thing, and maybe I'll let you do something easy, nice with my body. What time should I pick you up? Her laughter sounded like verbal sunlight. I'll pick you up in a limousine. I think we should have dinner and strategize. I don't want to be unprepared if he asks me which thong is your favorite. There was silence for a moment before she giggled. 
I'm not a thong fan, but if he asks, say light green. I won't. I'll tell him that your new favorite is the black ones that I took off of you in the limo on the way and put in my pocket. I love these privacy panels. There was some silence, which turned into giggling. This will be so much fun. We went for dinner on Sunday. She had a very nice house. Not too big, not flashy, more simple, clean lines and elegance. After examining it through the eyes of a builder, I told her how much I liked it. She frowned for a second. You should have seen the McMansion he convinced me to buy. Why do two people need six bedrooms? This one has three, but I have about the same area. I gave it to him in my divorce, and he lost it in my next divorce. He now lives in a one-bedroom apartment and can barely afford it. It sucks to be him, right? First he lost quality, then he lost quantity. His next deal will probably be more of a pay-as-you-go deal. She gave me a sharp look and suppressed a laugh. Don't make me cry at the dinner table. It would be indecent. And thank you, Reggie. I shrugged. Sometimes all you have to do is tell the truth. This lobster sounds very attractive, doesn't it? We had a nice, leisurely dinner, and our conversation carried everywhere. We talked about places we've been, places we'd like to return to. Dinner was soon over, and we both didn't seem to want it to end, so I took her to a little place that a lot of people didn't even know about. It was a traditional music venue. One week it might be folk singers, the next it might be country or bluegrass. Some weeks they had African bands playing only percussion instruments, and sometimes blues or acoustic jazz. She sat all night, captivated by the performance, a blues duet consisting of a woman in her thirties and a man in his fifties. He played guitar and keyboards and performed other songs on bass and dubbed on harmonica. She was also a very good guitarist. They had bass drums and tall hats, and sometimes you wouldn't believe there were only two people on stage unless you saw it with your own eyes. When they had a break, the others looked at us sideways. I was wearing a very beautiful suit, and Angie was dressed to the nines in a copper-colored silk case that was literally dripping with diamonds. Most of them were wearing jeans and t-shirts. She broke the ice as the woman sat next to her, and soon her phone went off, and she began dialing numbers she suggested she try if she liked what she heard that night. When we left, Angie was still high on adrenaline and talking a mile a minute. I walked her to the door, and she sighed. I really, really want to invite you to breakfast tomorrow, but it's too early. We'll just put it on the IU and promise that if you're a good boy, very, very good things will happen soon. Until then, here. It was a kissing session. Finally, she pushed me away. Enough. Just a little longer, and we'll be removing the PG rating for this front door. Good night, Reg. Good night, my hot little granny. Take a look if you don't know what it means. See you on Saturday. If I thought she was a standout on a date, then the dress she wore to the event was nothing short of spectacular. Floor-length black in a shiny fabric with a high slit and a low enough neckline to make it clear that she had very nice breasts who just wanted to get out. Her slender legs were emphasized by what must have been four-inch heels. She smirked at my reaction. Shut your mouth, dear. I told you I'm trying my best. Do you like the way girls look? I'm wearing a very impressive bra. You have very impressive breasts. Now I'll spend all night wondering what the bra looks like. She giggled and then handed me something. Here, a small gift to remember this night. I looked at a very tiny thong, lacy, black. Her smile grew wider. Yes, I wore them for a while. I wouldn't want him to see them and think they're not real. Just so you know, they match the bra. We arrived at the hotel, and I assumed that her business, judging by the turnout, was quite large. There were almost 200 people there, and most of them were lined up to kiss her ass. Many of them looked me over, trying to figure out where I fit into the grand scheme of things. Angie was kind and friendly in just the right combination. We mingled and mingled, and after about 45 minutes I felt her tense up. It's the X, she whispered. I looked and saw an average, slightly overweight man holding the hand of a woman barely out of her teens. 
It looked sad and vulgar at the same time. He came up to us. Angie. This was said evenly, without any emotion. She, on the contrary, was all smiles. Hello, Ben. Let me introduce my boyfriend. This is Reggie Wilkes. Reggie, my ex-husband, Ben. He had a limp handshake, the kind that would immediately make you mistrust him. But then again, maybe my first impression was colored by what she told me about him. He didn't speak much, but the girl he was with was chatting. She acted confidently, but her eyes gave her away. She looked at me as if she was assessing my net worth. I had saved a decent amount through my business, but I doubted I was in the same tax bracket as Angie. I wasn't stupid with my money, and I was living quite well. Angie was polite and looked like she was trying to suppress her laughter. We had a surprisingly good lunch and Angie gave her speech to thunderous applause. Her ex then gave a dull and boring speech, promising that as long as he was at the helm, the company would be in good hands. I got the feeling that this opinion is not widespread. The applause seemed lukewarm at best. Then the orchestra began to play. Angie was an excellent dancer, and I was no slouch, so we stayed on the dance floor for a while. Then she had to perform obligatory dances with people in the company. I danced with my wives and girlfriends. The most common topic was the question of how serious we are. I had a standard answer. I'm just a sweet gift. She'll take me home tonight and then run me away until she needs me again. Some thought I was serious but most of the women giggled and said she made a great choice. I went a little overboard when I danced with her ex-husband's girlfriend, telling her that we were going on a huge tour of Europe at the end of the summer and would be staying at my villa in France and a condo in London and then maybe fly to the islands. I thought that I would have to tear her away from me. Angie noticed my discomfort and saved me by gently removing her hands from me. Sorry, darling, but he's mine. Take comfort, you got a consolation prize. Shall we dance, darling? I told her what I said, and she laughed. Her ex approached me while I was refreshing our drinks. Are you and Angie serious? If I had the opportunity, I would suggest changing the name of the company. He exploded. The company is mine. There will be no name changes. The company was yours, and as far as I know, you literally had sex with her until you lost your breath. I hope you understand that the little head is prone to making bad business decisions. As far as I know, you better be careful with Bimbo Hash too, otherwise you will own only 12.5%. Bitch, I want you. What are you talking about, Ben? Look at Reggie. There's not an ounce of padding in that suit. It's clear he's doing more than just 12-ounce curls, and he'll take you apart. I'm ready to watch it, so go for it. I'll make sure no one didn't interfere until you were done. No, smart choice. Angie turned to me with a wicked glint in her eyes. Darling, I think I've lost one piece of clothing. Have you seen? This, I held the panties in my hand. Sorry, honey. The limo didn't take as long as we thought, and you didn't have time to put them back on, remember? She took the panties from my hand smiling at her ex-husband. Thank you for looking after them, dear. I would put them on again, but it would be in vain. You could take them off again before we left the parking lot. I suddenly have a strong desire to call it a night. Shall we go? A wave of whispers swept through the hall as snatches of conversation were passed around, and many ladies and a few men hugged her as we left. Her ex-husband was really not very popular. She was still giggling when we got into the limo. Did you see his face? I thought he was going to fall through the floor, and his little doll looked at him with completely different eyes. If she thought she could take it away without consequences, she would have attacked you right on the floor in front of the whole crowd. Of course, if she tried something with you, I would knock the silicone bags right out of her fake breasts. Wow. Remind me never to get on your bad side. It was a fun night. Some parts were better than others. Which parts? Those parts when I was alone with you and we were cuddling on the dance floor. You really are a very attractive woman, and I noticed. The giggles returned. Believe me, darling, when we were hugging, I noticed that you noticed. It was very flattering. 
If the car had not been dark, she would have seen my blush. I'm not sorry. I'd be offended if you apologized. We gradually moved closer to each other, and soon we started kissing. Things got interesting when the car delivered us to her door. We tidied up our clothes, but we both saw the driver's grin. He should get used to this behavior. We stood in her hallway, smiling stupidly. She gave me a look I couldn't decipher, kissed me hard, then pushed me away. I'd like nothing more than to get you inside, but it's too early. You're the first man I've taken seriously in a long time, but it's too early. We need to build this up little by little. Having said that, it's time for you to ask me out on a real date. I pretended to be angry. In my opinion, it was a real date. A real date that ended in great discomfort for the man. Do you have any compassion? I sighed dramatically and gave her a chaste kiss on the cheek. As I was getting into my car, she placed something in my hands. Here, this is what I actually wore under the dress. I watched as she closed the door, a pair of red lace shorts. On Monday, I sent her flowers to her office with a card. Please accept this as a token of my great affection for you. Will you grant me your company on Friday at 7? I knew her personal assistant would read the note and share it. She brought flowers to the office. A guy sent this and asked for a date on Friday. If you're not interested, can I pick him up? Joan, honey, you know I love you, but say something like that again and I'll transfer you. My ex needs a new assistant. Got it. If I beg on my knees, will you leave me? You're worth your weight in gold, but say something that's stupid again. Got it, boss. Where do you think he'll take you? I'll let you know on Monday. We had several very pleasant phone conversations throughout the week. I told her to dress casually, jeans, and a comfortable top, since the events I had planned were very informal. I later found out that she took her personal assistant with her on a shopping spree to make sure she picked out the perfect jeans. I didn't know it, but until that moment there weren't any jeans in her wardrobe. When I picked her up, I approved of her choice. The jeans weren't too tight, but they were very, very tight and she filled them out perfectly. She was wearing a light green top with a small cutout that was very tempting. She smiled when she saw me and ran her hands over my chest. Do you wax? This is a very personal question. I guess I'll wait and let you find out for yourself. Also, do you prefer smooth skin? She turned three shades red and laughed. I'll return the favor too. You'll just have to find out for yourself. So, where are we going? I took her to a small buffet restaurant that I had discovered. The menu for the evening was posted by the kitchen door and served family style. There were no separate tables, only a few long ones that almost crossed the entire establishment. The food was served in large bowls, and if you wanted more mashed potatoes or meatloaf, you had to ask the person next to you to pass it on. It was rude not to talk, and soon you found yourself talking to the person opposite or next to you. Once Angie got used to the idea, she talked almost all the time. She shared dessert recipes with the older woman across from her and gave makeup tips to the young wife next to her. I talked about sports, cars, and avoided politics. One day she held a baby in her arms while his mother went to the toilet and beamed with joy. She told me that she has two young grandchildren, but they live in California and she rarely sees them. She was very happy and when we arrived at the music venue, she was just beaming. An acoustic jazz quartet was performing there that evening. Guitar, double bass, violin, and accordion. The guitarist was a woman. She and the double bassist shared vocal parts, while others joined in on the chorus. They played many instrumentals that showed their skills. We recognized some, but most were new to us. They were selling old-fashioned CDs, and Angie bought three. They played some slow songs and invited those who wanted to come out onto the dance floor. We danced three songs. This time I made it to her couch, and we were literally millimeters away from having sex when she stopped us. I want it so bad. The problem is, if I get it, I'll want it all the time. Please let me set the pace. I promise that if we stay the course, the destination will be worth the journey. The journey is already worth it, my dear. I can wait, 
but I don't know if I can hold out much longer. Soon, my dear. My dear. I loved her giggle. It made her sound so young. Yes, my darling. I've always wanted to say this to a man and really feel it. After two frustrating weeks, she called me and asked if I liked boats. I think so, I replied. When I was younger, I had canoes and kayaks, and my dad had a fishing boat. Will you take me on a boat on Saturday? I have a boat, or rather, my ex had a boat. I made sure I got it in the divorce. I did it just to piss him off, and it worked. I have it on the dock, and they take care of it there, but I never used it. In all the years that he owned it, he never took me on it. I want to know if this is a pleasant enough experience for me to want to keep it or sell it. Of course. From what I remember, this could be a lot of fun. Give me directions. Thank you, dear. Don't worry about bringing anything. I've got it all taken care of. Is eight o'clock too early? It will be ideal. It will still be cool and comfortable. The midday sun reflecting off the water in summer can be very intense. We'll plan a trip to stay cool. See you then. This was an upscale marina, and I had a feeling her boat would be a luxury model. After I had recovered from her outfit real Daisy Duke shorts and a men's white shirt tied under her breasts, revealing her toned tummy, unbuttoned enough to show her swimsuit top, she led me to the docks. We walked to what was clearly a restored wooden Chris Craft boat, and I couldn't help but admire it. I was surprised when she walked past him and headed towards the very end of the piers. I think I even started. It wasn't a boat. It was a house on the water, 45 feet long, almost completely enclosed, with almost the full length of the upper deck covered with a canopy. Is this his boat? No, honey. This is my boat. It's fully fueled, everything is charged, and we just need to release the mooring lines. Ready? There was a control set on the upper deck, as well as on the foredeck below. I felt better up there because it had a better view, and I didn't let her talk while I concentrated on moving away from the dock. As soon as we left the marina, we increased our speed a little and were both surprised at how fast this boat could boast. Once we reached the main channel, we slowed down and swam slowly. Angie passed me her favorite craft cider. I held out my hand for him and was suddenly glad that I was not driving a car. I would have broken it. While I was focused, she managed to change into a swimsuit. Even for her age, she had a very toned body, and she wore a very flattering swimsuit yellow with white polka dots. The top made her breast stand high and proud, and the bottom was two fingers wider than the thong. I knew this ass was going to be killer, and I was right. She giggled again. Eyes on the lake, big guy. Yes, it will happen. That better be. I have good plans, plans that don't involve running aground. I have a map that the marina operator gave me, dear. He said the landmarks would be easy to find, and besides, we have GPS on our phones. And navigation system. Another hour or so, and we'll be there. There turned out to be a small cove between one of the lake's larger islands and a smaller one that barely covered two acres. It was a mountain lake, the first of a chain of lakes that stretched across the lowlands, each of which became increasingly polluted. Here the water was clear and almost untouched, allowing you to see into the depths. It was the kind of water you wanted to jump into on a hot summer day. Once the boat was securely anchored, Angie suggested we go for a little swim. I told you I'd take care of everything, she said with a sly glint in her eyes. I bought you a bathing suit. It's on the bed. Why don't you change? I didn't realize how big the inside of this boat was. The living room kitchen area was impressive. Even a fairly large TV was mounted on the wall. The bedroom was smaller, barely big enough to accommodate a huge bed. The small piece of fabric seemed even smaller as it lay on top of her. I picked it up, smiling. They were Speedos, light blue, and even for this style they were small. The pudding process was interesting, and I briefly thought about stuffing two bowling balls into the marble bag as I pulled them onto my feet. Looking in the full-length bathroom mirror, I thought how good it was that I spent so much time at the gym. I didn't look like I was twenty, but I had nothing to be ashamed of. 
I walked back out onto the deck with a towel wrapped around my waist, mostly for effect. She was about to ask me if I was wearing them when I let the towel slide to the floor. Her hand flew to her mouth, and she blushed a little before smiling again. You look delicious. You've been looking delicious since we left the dock. Shall we take a swim? The water was cold, at least at first. Then we got used to it, and it was great. Angie seemed in her natural habitat, swimming with the grace of an otter. We played and hugged. I think we better hide before this goes any further. There aren't many people here, but it's still a public lake. I let her walk up the stairs in front of me. We made love. When I lay down next to her, I thought I saw tears in her eyes. Are you okay, honey? She was just fiddling with my chest hair. I'm more than fine. I'm just wonderful. For some reason, that's the only word that comes to mind. It's been a long time, and I didn't know if it would be as good as I remembered. It was so much better that the word good just doesn't fit. You're the best lover I've ever had. Don't underestimate yourself. You are the first woman with whom I have felt such passion. You, we, were in a moment much deeper than I have ever experienced. For the first time, the words as one mean something to me. And then she started crying, but she still held on to me until it went away. When she recovered, she just lay there, rubbing small strokes over my chest. I'm glad you don't shave, honey. The ex does it, and he doesn't have the body for it. It just makes him look plump and soft. You might look good, but I much prefer the feel of your hair. This reminds me that I'm with a real man. We fell asleep, hugging each other, and when we woke up we were hungry, and it was already getting dark outside. She put on her robe, I put the speedo back on, and we quietly prepared a light meal in the kitchen. You don't have to do this, she said as I helped. I don't have to. Sometimes I won't if we expand our relationship, but sometimes I'll make you sit on the counter with a glass of wine while I impress you with my cooking skills. It's called a partnership, honey. Tears appeared in her eyes, and I thought I had done something wrong. Then she smiled. I'll try to pretend to enjoy this while you do it. What would you like for a snack? This is it, I said, unbuttoning her robe. Enough or we won't finish dinner. They'll be here for you later, I promise. We ate a simple meal and cleaned up separately because the shower simply wasn't big enough. I put on my boxers and she put on a silk robe that barely covered her bodysuit. She put on a jazz CD she'd bought on site, made a couple drinks, and we cuddled on the surprisingly comfortable couch. She suddenly started laughing. He bought this thing thinking it would be smart. Now there would be no trace of motel receipts and all he had to do was go out and meet his little bimbo at the next dock. I would never have known. How long did it last? Until the first time I saw it, it was registered in both of our names, and it cost very little to hook it up for video and audio. I let him go three times to get enough material, then used him to get a better settlement. I made sure he knew I was going to take it and gave him the Corvette that was worth half as much in exchange. Sorry for asking, but why did you marry such an idiot? I heard the sadness in her voice. He was a good man when we got married. As we became more successful, he became more and more self-confident, thinking that his success should justify everything. Age became a factor, and frankly, I think she was the physical equivalent of a sports car in the midst of a midlife crisis. She wasn't smart, but she was very cunning and quickly tied him down, asking why he was still with a tired old woman when he could have been seen with her. When I caught them, this worked to her advantage. By that time, I didn't care. She was a joy to him. Instead of everyone admiring him for what he did and who he did to, most people thought he was stupid, and a lot of people actually felt sorry for him. I think when he realized that, it squashed his remaining ego for a while. Then she cheated him, and he was left with nothing for his bad decisions. I practically owned the company, and he had to live with it. It's very similar to what happened to me. I thought I was doing well, but she had tastes for more refined things, and it didn't take long before she found someone. It killed me for a long time. Before I could cope, and made me very cautious in the relationship. I think I already told you 
but it didn't quite work out the way she planned. The prenuptial agreement was pretty strict, and by that time she had burned all her bridges, so she agreed. I heard that she has a limited budget, and if she goes over it, she will be left without money until the end of the month. I think it will end badly in the next couple of days. Years. After all, he proved that he doesn't mind playing with people in relationships. Perhaps your ex and my ex will find each other after their next divorces. That would be funny. Time to go to bed. She took off her robe and spun around a couple of times before climbing into bed. We dreamed of great things, but she fell asleep as soon as we hugged. I chuckled in the darkness, feeling her breath. Quality over quantity. I like this lifestyle. We hopped in bed and in the water for the rest of the weekend, returning to the marina just before dark on Sunday evening. When we were returning, I asked her if we were in an exclusive relationship. Even in the dim light, I saw the sparkle in her eyes. I have a good desire to throw you overboard. I haven't been with another man in almost a year, and I'm quite happy with the one I have now. Any other stupid questions? No, darling. Great. How about you? My break is not that long, but I will say that since I saw you at the club for the first time, I have not been with anyone. I assure you, I like what we have, and I am not going to spoil it. So we're officially a couple. Do you need a contract? I just hugged her tighter. No, I think verbal commitments work better in these cases, don't you? Absolutely. We stood on the dock for several minutes before I collected my thoughts. Now what? Now we go to our homes and think about this day off and what it means to us personally. In a couple of days, you'll pack a few changes of clothes that you can leave at my house, move in on Wednesday or Thursday, and we'll see what happens next. How about Monday or Tuesday? Don't push it. I need to process this. I've been alone for a long time, and I need to get used to the fact that I'm part of a couple now. That's what we did. I arrived on Thursday, and she almost dragged me into the house. I left on Sunday evening and returned on Wednesday. Almost two months passed before she sat down to talk to me. Her version of the conversation usually meant that she did the talking and I agreed. One day she asked me why I do so many things for her. Because I, I like to please you. I enjoy giving you joy. In time, if I truly believe that you're making a bad decision or I just don't like what I'm hearing, you'll know it. I believe that you are smart enough to know the line between L, affection and weakness. She was beaming. Well, I've decided that I love you enough that I want to see if I can tolerate you on a regular basis. When can you move out completely? God, this is so sudden. I don't know how L tomorrow. Most of my stuff is already here. I'll put a few things in storage that I want to keep, and in a few months maybe hire a rental agent. The house is empty, should not. I took her hands. Now to the point. You own your house and I own mine, so there are no mortgage payments. I insist that we split the household bills equally. I can't stand the thought of being considered a kept man, and you know that rumors will spread. This also applies to household chores. I'm sure you're better at laundry, but I'm pretty good at everything else, so I'll take on more than my share. And if you can't stand pampering, now's the time. Time to retreat. I know how much you love working outside. Lawn service is cancelled next week, and we'll consider it the same as laundry. Everything else in half. Shall we seal it with a kiss? No, let's seal it like this. I picked her up over my shoulder, and she squealed and laughed, hitting my back as I carried her to the bedroom. Rumors quickly spread throughout her company. Angie simply smiled when her ex tried to warn her that I was a gold digger, and she posted pictures of us together on her desk and wall. Bimbo Hash too strongly hinted at the ring, and he had his own problems, so he let it go. Six months later, we worked out our schedule. I was more of a morning person, so I was usually the first one to get up, make coffee, and sometimes make a light breakfast. She usually cooked dinner. I was mowing the grass and one day I came up with an idea that I would pay for myself. We ended up splitting the costs and I built an outdoor kitchen and patio. Angie wore sweatpants and helped whenever she could, 
even when I told her it wasn't necessary. This is our home, and I don't want to be excluded from any projects we do to improve it. It took almost three months, and we were extremely proud when we finished. The small covered structure contained a very nice gas grill, a charcoal grill, a four-burner gas stove built into granite countertops, along with a small refrigerator and a deep sink. We could have easily hired contractors, but that didn't make sense. The point was that we did this together, and it was a labor of love. We sometimes invited friends, especially after we redid the yard. Angie sometimes entertained clients. I talked her into it. It's much more effective to invite them to your home rather than to some faceless restaurant. It creates a connection on a more personal level. This is your home. You live here. You show them parts of yourself that they would never normally see, and that often changes their perception of you for the better. They will relax and be much more open to any negotiations you enter into. Do not let them talk about business while they are here unless it is in very general terms. Her business partners were impressed. It was pretty easy to understand. They were used to dealing with her ex, and he was all about business, sometimes with heavy drinking and clubbing. He insulted one of the suppliers so much that Angie invited him over to apologize and insisted that he bring his wife. They were supposed to stay at a hotel, but she contacted his wife and insisted they stay with her. It became a quarterly event, and he responded in kind, inviting us to his place every six months. This usually devolved into shopping for the ladies and sporting events for us, but it was in good spirits. We took them on a boat once, and they were so impressed that they bought their own. Angie always thought of me as her life partner. At first it was nice, but then it started to annoy me. Almost a year after I moved, I met her son and his family. They lived on the other coast, and she rarely saw them. When he called and asked to come over, she was over the moon, cleaning until I made her stop. Do I need to disappear so you can spend quality time? She slapped me. You're part of my life now. They know about you, and I sent them pictures. So no, just, no. He looked a lot like his mother, but I saw traits of his father in him, especially in some of his relationships. However, unless he was friendly, he was not aggressive. His wife and children were completely different. The boy was nine years old, the girl seven. Heather was a true beauty from California and was as warm as a freshly baked apple pie. When she and the children saw the garden, they were delighted as it was the closest thing to real food they had ever seen. Before I thought about it, I promised them a trip to the farmer's market on Saturday. Angie bought the house and three acres of undeveloped land at a time when there were no neighbors nearby. I wanted a garden, but the woman who runs the homeowners association saw me working the land and rushed across the yard, screaming for me to stop. She then started telling me how many association rules I had broken and that she was going to impose a fine. The problem with this plan was that Angie's house and lot were not part of her development. It was already here and buildings grew on both sides of it. I just laughed and continued to work the land, doing everything very carefully. Once the area was prepared, Angie helped me put up a white fence around it. From the street, you couldn't tell what it was. She immediately took control of the garden, telling me to plant more tomatoes, lettuce, and green beans. She searched for sites tirelessly and ordered enough to plant ten acres. I made her choose based on the available space, and she immediately wanted to expand the garden. The president of the association caused a scandal and threatened to tear down the fence. I just smiled and told her that this might not be the best idea she's ever had, so she decided to sue me. Angie took the day off to come with me. The president presented graphs, diagrams, rules, and put forward quite convincing arguments. Then it was our turn. Angie showed the judge her deed of title, and when the judge read it, she laughed and tapped her gavel. Case is closed. We thought the woman was going to have a stroke when the judge explained to her that since our property was not part of her development, we were free to do whatever we wanted with it, within reason. The judge threatened her with a weekend in jail to keep her quiet. Angie had a mischievous glint in her eye when she asked me to make her a scarecrow frame for the next month. While I was doing this, she went shopping. When the scarecrow was ready, 
It was dressed in the same clothes that the association president preferred, down to the large straw hat she liked to wear in the summer. Maybe Angie exaggerated the size of her ass a little. It took two bales of hay to fill these stretch pants. She smiled. I read about a man in a similar situation, and this is what he did. I couldn't think of a better way to stick my tongue out at her. Every time she drove past our house to get to hers, she saw it. The other owners laughed at this, but tried not to let her see them. She lost the election for the next term, and the new president was much more lenient towards the owners. He even put on the ballot permitting small backyard gardens as long as they are properly fenced. Suddenly, we became better acquainted with our neighbors as they sought our advice. I got a little carried away and bought a huge walk behind tractor that was practically sitting idle after I prepared our land, so I offered to help. Angie would come with me and sit with our wives on the patio or in the air-conditioned house while my husbands and I worked in the heat. They soon had a Facebook group for sharing tips and showing off the vegetables they wanted to show off. If they had more than they could use, they offered it to the group. Very little was wasted. Heather arrived on Saturday without her youngest. When I asked, she said he wanted to talk to his mother alone. Something was wrong. We all got into the rental car because it already had child seats. She seemed to really enjoy the market, although she rarely smiled. The children ran from side to side, trying to see everything. In addition to offering fresh vegetables, there was a subgroup of artisans. Potters, artists, jewelers, there was even a guy who wrote custom poems for $10 and printed them out on his laptop. I thought it was stupid, but he told me he earned two or three hundred dollars a day. Not bad for a hungry literature student. The kids came across an artist painting faces and practically begged him to do it for them. Heather hesitated, but I smiled and pointed to the children. He's a lion and she's a tiger. Full face. I walked away and was talking to one of the craftsmen when Heather came up to me with the children. The intricate face paintings made me smile. He smiled. Does Angie know you're hanging out with this hottie? Heather blushed, then smiled one of her rare smiles. Mom knows, but if a girl can't trust her father-in-law, then who can she trust? It caught me off guard and I blinked a couple of times. The kids wanted to buy crystals and she looked confused, but Bob smiled. Now you will know how convenient it is to have a wealthy father-in-law. If he is a real grandfather, he will buy his grandchildren everything they want. Damn dust. I forgot how much there is at this time of year. Before Heather could object, Lynette picked out a pair of earrings, little fairies holding a tiny crystal. Jeremiah chose a necklace with a perfectly formed crystal. It was said to bring good luck and protection. Lynette heard what Bob said and hugged my knees. Thank you, Grandpa. Jeremiah thought he was too old to hug, but he smiled. Thank you, Grandfather. I was still holding Lynetta in my arms, and she seemed quite content. Bob showed Heather a ring with a crystal surrounded by gold bands that formed a flower. I bought it for her without a second thought, without blinking an eye when Bob told me how much it cost. I can't accept this. I smiled at her. I know you haven't been with us long, but there's no point in pissing off Grandpa. It looks perfect on you. Bob told me it's been sitting in his display case for a year, waiting for the right finger. Don't fight the magic. I was still holding Lynetta, who had already fallen asleep. Heather took Jeremiah's hand, and we walked. I was so proud that I don't think my feet even touched the ground until we got to the car. The kids fell asleep as soon as we hit the highway. I gave it a few minutes before I started talking. I'm a pretty perceptive person about what you should keep in mind in the future, and I can see that something is wrong. Why don't you tell me what's going on so Angie and I can help you? She tried to object, but the words were stuck on her lips. Then she started talking. We're broke. We had to spend all our savings to come here. I wondered what Junior was telling Angie as she poured out her tale of woe. Junior was laid off under less than ideal circumstances and found it difficult to find work. They always lived large, and the money quickly disappeared. They lost their home, her rental car, and had to pull their children out of private school. 
It killed his soul to come here, but we had no choice. We asked his father first, but thanks to his personal choices. She snorted disdainfully. He couldn't. Mom is our last hope. Don't worry too much about Angie. She won't let her grandchildren suffer. And neither will I, for that matter. What is he asking? I have no idea. A short-term loan, probably. Something to tide us over until we find a job. He doesn't want me to work, but if I find a job before him, it'll be his problem. I knew Angie. She will not leave her son and his family in trouble. I also knew that she wouldn't just blindly give him money, especially if he was anything like his father. He will receive help, but there will be conditions. When I asked Heather how much cash they had, she blushed and didn't answer. I made her stop in the parking lot of the bank branch where I worked and withdrew a thousand dollars in cash and gave her an envelope. Don't argue, don't object, just put it in your bag and use it as you see fit. And if you ever say a word about giving me my money back, I will be deeply, deeply offended. You will quickly lose your status as a favorite daughter-in-law, it's clear. I decided to drive to give her time to cry. By the time we got home, it was already packed. Angie and Junior were waiting for us in the living room. Lynette ran up and jumped into her lap. Grandma, I'm a tiger. Look what Grandpa gave me. Aren't they cute? I saw the youngest tense, but Angie simply smiled, hugging the child. They are amazing. Grandpa has never given me something so beautiful. This wasn't entirely true, considering the ring I had hidden in the shed. I just couldn't find the right moment to give it to her. Because I'm the youngest and a girl. Grandpas are supposed to do things like that. That's what Jenny says. Well, your friend Jenny seems to be very smart. Jeremiah, do you have something to show me? He smiled and pulled the necklace out from under his T-shirt. Grandpa's friend said it was supposed to protect me from evil spirits. Mom got something too. She hesitantly showed the ring to Angie. She looked at me in surprise before tears started running down her cheeks. Now I'm going to have to keep a close eye on your grandfather or you'll end up with a lot of jewelry. Lynette, do you want to help me make cupcakes? Soon they were both holding her hands, leading her to the kitchen. The younger one looked at me for a while. You are not their grandfather. Heather gasped. I just looked at him calmly. No, not by blood. Do you think it matters to them? Does it hurt a child to think that there are more people who love him? Where is your father, Benny? He's too busy to see his only grandchildren, his testimony of immortality. Do you have any idea how valuable this is? Most likely not, but you should understand. I kissed Heather on the cheek and left. I went out to the garden shed and sharpened my tools for forty minutes. My father taught me from an early age that hoes, shovels, picks are all like knives. They are carvers, in this case soil carvers. If they have a sharp edge, they do their job better. Once I was done, I started sharpening the pruning shears, and by the time I was done they could be used to cut hair. There was a soft knock and Heather asked if she could come in. I simply nodded, and she stood there hesitantly. Please don't hold it against him. He is facing the worst failure for a man not being able to provide for his family. I understand that, dear, but it especially means that you should not attack the hand that is trying to help. His father made bad life choices. It is not the younger man's fault. It is his fault. His bright future with a woman of exceptional quality disappeared in one day, and he will never return it. He needs to come to terms with his choices and try not to repeat them a second time. His son has to make a choice, too. Angie has told me many times how much she misses you, especially the grandchildren. Heather, she will take care of her family. I know her well enough to do that. But I also know that she won't just blindly give him money and hope for the best. She wanted you to live here for years, and this is her chance. I bet she will offer him a job. He is not my heir. I already told her that I don't want to have anything to do with it. To her company. It's none of my business. Changing the subject, where did you stop? We stayed at the Marriott for the night. After that, I don't know. I think I have an idea, but I need to talk to your mother-in-law first. Let's go, it's almost dinner, 
and I'm sure Jeremiah doesn't like to miss a meal. She hugged me tightly. I wish they were your grandchildren. I'd sleep a lot better at night. I looked around the kitchen, noticing the mess from the little kids trying to bake, and made a decision. We're going to grill today. I asked Heather what their favorite foods were and sent her in my car to the store. The younger one went with her. I wondered what they would talk about. Angie put the kids to bed after they were cleaned up, and we took advantage of that to tidy up the kitchen. It was fun. Her face was glowing. I wish I could film it. Heather was helping until she went looking for you. Junior went to visit his dad for a while. Her tears flowed. I wish we could keep them. Lynette is a big fan, dear. She told me Grandpa Reggie is going to cook the corn you picked for her tonight. Do you mind if they call you Grandpa? About as much as I hate it when you call me darling. Oh, how disgusting. She giggled. Yeah, maybe I should call you something else. How about honey? Ugh, stay on darling. Okay, she said before hugging me. We were in the middle of a serious kiss when we heard giggling. Linny woke up. Before she could move, I grabbed her, and we both showered her with kisses for a minute. Grandpa, are we going to cook the corn? Yes, we will. Come with me. I put the corn cobs in ice water earlier, and they were ready. I placed Linny on a large chair at the prep table and showed her how to pull back the husk to put the butter inside and then seal it tightly. I tied them with fireproof ties, and they were ready. By then Jeer had woken up and was helping. Their mother walked in and they rushed towards her, asking if she had bought their favorite foods hot dogs and hamburgers. She did buy them, as well as steaks, chops, and some chicken breasts. Jeer helped me thoroughly rub the chicken and wrap it in foil. Mom rubbed the steaks and chops, letting them sit and come to room temperature. Angie caught up with her afterward to help with the sides. Coleslaw, big thick steak fries, and sliced zucchini that was marinated and ready to grill. The cupcakes stood proudly on display, our dessert for the evening. Junior decided to stay with his father, and Heather seemed relieved by that. I prepared enough food for three large dishes, knowing they would want to try a little of everything. Linny ate three pieces of chicken, three pieces of steak, several fries, and an entire ear of corn, laughing as she peeled off the burnt husks. Jeer ate one hot dog and half a chop and steak, skipping everything else except the corn on the cob. Then we had to eat the cupcake. Linny brought one to me, so proud she was about to burst. The frosting was about two inches high. I made this one for you, Grandpa. She beamed with pride as I kissed her cheek. Thanks, baby. He looks great. She watched anxiously until I ate every bite. They really looked happy when Heather told them they were all staying the night and the bath was drawn. After they got into their pajamas, I held Linny while Angie held Jeer, gently rocking him until he fell asleep. They woke up as we were putting them to bed and insisted that we take turns reading the story to them. Angie held my hand with such strength as if she was about to explode from simple happiness. Heather was in the living room with a glass of wine. Thank you. You have no idea what it's like to have a chance to relax. I remember, Angie said. The younger one was a hyperactive child and required a lot of attention. Well, while you're here, you have built-in babysitters. You might get tired of coming and rescuing them. It may take a while, and I'd like to get to that point. It all depends on your son. Angie sat next to her and hugged her. I know, honey. I'm working on it. That night, as we lay in bed, we had a rather intense conversation. Do you know their situation? I asked. Most of them. I was so angry when I found out. They should have come home then. We would have taken care of them. I think your son has as much misguided pride as your ex. What were you talking about while I was with Heather and the kids? He has this get-rich-quick scheme that he wants me to invest in. One million. I have money. I have that kind of money. But it's not just lying around. And even if it was, I wouldn't let go until I investigate. I told him I'd look into it before committing, and he got angry. They're broke. It's their last night in that hotel. They can come here, but he doesn't like the idea. 
Do you mind if I give you a solution? I'm all ears. The residents of my house moved out last week. I knew it would only be for six months, but they moved out, and the only reason they needed a house was to have somewhere to live while their house was being built. Let them live. It's free there. It'll give them some privacy while they come to terms with their situation. Maybe we can find Heather something to do until he comes to his senses. I love you. It came out with such force that it made me smile. Sometimes it was difficult to get her to say it. Every time I came close to talking about marriage, she put it off, citing the age difference. This was really starting to annoy me and one day she said it too many times. But dear, I'm seven years old. I lost it. Before she knew it, I had her on my lap. I took a minute to admire her beautifully defined ass before my hand dropped. This will happen every time you mention it, understand, and I'll add one hit each time. Get your head out of your ass and accept that I don't care how old you are. You are the one I chose. Maybe this is your way of telling me that things won't work out between us. If that's the case, I'd better leave now. She was still sitting on the sofa, sobbing, when I walked past with a suitcase. Her eyes opened wide, and I felt that she didn't believe me. Honey, wait. We. I'll call you, but not soon. Give me some space to decide whether I'm wasting my time or not. She begged as I walked out the door. I was part owner of a construction company and one of the field emergency managers. I decided it was an emergency and spent a week in another city raising an office complex. The unions gave us a hard time, and some suppliers listened to their recommendations that our materials should become scarce. I wasn't in the mood, so I pulled all our employees from the site and assigned them to other projects. Two days later, a for sale sign appeared in front of the property, shocking everyone. The unions made threats but I was within my rights and told the truth to the newspapers and local television stations, backing up my words with facts and figures. Unions suddenly began to feel pressure from their members who were out of work, and politicians began talking about permits and investigations. Suppliers had a heart attack when I canceled almost $2 million worth of orders. We have a contract. You really have and the fine print of this contract says that if you are late with deliveries more than three times a month, we have the right to look for other suppliers. Have a nice day. Everyone tried to make me out to be a villain, but the public was not deceived. A month later, we returned with better contracts from suppliers, and the unions became much more flexible in achieving their new goals. Both of my partners thought I was a genius, but I was just angry and needed to take it out on someone. Nine days after I left, I walked out of the trailer that served as my construction office and saw Angie sitting in her Mercedes. She looked scared to death, but determined. When I approached her, she came out, and I think our hearts were in our throats. As she approached me, she tried to speak before she let out a small cry and jumped into my arms, trying to kiss me and talk at the same time. I finally gave up and took her to the office. I looked at the engineers and production assistants, and everyone suddenly had the urge to grab coffee at the cafe next door. I closed the door behind them. Sorry for spanking you. There was a lot of frustration building up there, and I just snapped. Please, if we stay together, just stop. I hope by now you understand how much I care about this number. I think I finally understand. I forgive you as long as you never do it again. All I promise is that if you come close to this again, I will remind you how it ended last time. Agreed. Now let's go home. You must kiss this place seven times for each time you hurt. I couldn't help but smile. I will do it twice in one go to apologize for my crime. We sat and talked and kissed until the team got up the courage to go back. I looked at my assistant. You're on your own until the end of the project, Mark. You've proven yourself capable, so consider this a test. If you can handle it, we always have room for another project manager. And Mark, no favors, okay? They will test you hard. Squash it at the very beginning and categorically refuse to back down, got it? Fine. See you at the head office. He delivered the property a week ahead of schedule and saved $20,000. 
He had ten of our employees, and I told him to give each one a thousand dollars as a bonus and make sure he was the one giving them the money. I gave him three. Angie and I gradually got back to where we were, but I wasn't as happy as I should have been. The fact that she avoided talking about marriage really bothered me. If she wanted to wait, that's fine, as long as I could see a happy ending. I remembered my first marriage, before the bad things happened, and realized that I loved being married, having a vow and a document to prove to the world that we were one. Now her son was here, and she was really tense. Two weeks later, she told her son the bad news. She checked its possibility, and it turned out that it was almost like a pyramid. Angie insisted that he come work for her for a short time to earn some money. He was reluctant at first until Heather lost patience and found a job herself. She got a job at a construction company as an office assistant. The salary was above average, and not because of who she was. This was because my partners and I decided from the beginning to hire the best and pay them accordingly. Sarah managed all office functions, and one of the first things she suggested was daycare for our employees, free of charge. You guys have no idea how much stress childcare costs can create, especially for a single mother. We will do this, and we will have employees for life. She herself was a single mother, and her share of the startup was covered by an inheritance from her grandmother. David and I talked about starting our own business, but it was just talk. She was the office manager at our old firm, and she basically got us going. We were so grateful that we named the business SDR Construction, named after Sarah, David, and Reggie. David was an engineer, and I was in construction. We had a very good personal reputation, and some of our corporate clients were unhappy with the management, so they gave us a chance. In 10 years, we have become a multi-million dollar construction company known for excellent quality at a reasonable price. Our old company was so angry when we left and poached several people that they threatened to sue us. Our lawyer said they could try something like that while he prepared all the paperwork and invited them to kiss our collective asses. We let Sarah say this because she had to endure a lot of crap and office politics during her years working there. She said it was one of the best moments of her life. If I arrived before Heather, she had to bring the kids before they went to kindergarten. I received hugs and kisses and really enjoyed starting the day that way. Heather always kissed me on the cheek. A month later I came and noticed that everyone was smiling at me. On my desk was a huge mug with photos of Linny and Jeremiah on the sides. On the other side it was written, The best grandfather in the world. But the most touching thing was on the smaller mug next to her, with a photo of Heather and the inscription, The best father-in-law in the world. I put them on the shelf so they would be the first thing I saw every morning, right next to the photo of me and Angie. Heather was called into Sarah's office and was informed that her position had changed. Now she had to run errands for the company, she needed to have good transportation, and she was asked to choose a suitable SUV so that it could accommodate everything she needed. After she cried, she made me go with her to the Ford dealership, where she chose the same model as mine, a four-door sports model with a small body. Angie just smiled as she talked about it. The closer I became to Heather and the children, the more distant her husband became. Ben S.R. came to me one day, apparently to threaten me. Stay away from my grandchildren. They are not yours. I think I made him nervous when I smiled. Have you told them that yet? Oh yeah, to say that, you'd have to spend time with them first, wouldn't you? How much time have you spent with them since they've been here? Did you take them somewhere or just watch them play? According to them, you didn't. And if you want them in your life, the best way to achieve this is to include them in your life. The aggression came out of him like air from a balloon. KC doesn't really like them. Then you have to make a choice. Barbie Bimbo or your grandchildren. It should be obvious, but I don't know your priorities. To be clear, I will stay out of their lives if Angie or the kid's parents say so, but I don't think so. That's likely. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to put together a playset. Do you want to help? I must have made an impression because he followed me to the house. Angie and Heather could have been knocked over by a feather as he stepped out of the car and the kids surrounded us both. It was quite a complex set, 
but I owned a construction company, and once Benny figured it out, it wasn't so bad. An hour later, he was pumping Jeremiah while I was pumping Linny. The ladies took over, and we drank some beer while watching them. He had tears in his eyes. I've made so many stupid choices in my life. From what I've heard, I have to agree with you. We don't know each other that well, but today showed a different side of you. The problem with stupid choices is that over time we learn from them. So, would you like to come to our weekly barbecue on Sunday? Heather took a lot of photos, and they ended up on her Facebook page later that evening. There were pictures of Benny and I tightening bolts while the kids waited impatiently. Some of the last ones were where we each rocked a child with the caption, Grandfather's Rule. Angie was all excited after everyone left. You're going to get some good love today. How did you do that? I didn't do anything out of the ordinary. Honey, you know by now, if there's something that needs to be said, I don't really hesitate. He deserves to be in their life if he can. I know my heart would be broken if I lost them. Damn it. Then she started crying and almost ruined the mood. Luckily, she recovered by the time night fell. There was a kind of truce between us and Benny. He came about every two weeks for barbecues. Sometimes he helped, but mostly he played with the children. Bubblegum Barbie saw him slipping away and gave him an ultimatum, but he didn't react very well. She moved out of the townhouse within two weeks. She was allowed to take all her clothes and jewelry, but she threw a fit when he said she couldn't take the sports car he rented for her. He finally told her that if she didn't stop, she could take the car and the 27 payments that were left on the lease. Heather was happy and enjoying her job. She was treated like any other employee, even if her father-in-law was one of the owners. This happened very rarely in the beginning, and she dealt with it. After that, everyone treated her like other workers, and she simply smiled and responded in kind. I looked at my life and realized that only two things were missing for it to be perfect. One would be the day Angie and I walked down the aisle. The other is when the younger one finally gets his life together. For some reason, he decided that all his problems were directly related to me. Angie and I had several intense discussions about how he was trying to treat me, and when Heather tried to talk to him about it, things went south. This turned into a full-blown, unbridled conversation, the gist of which was that if he didn't like his life here, he had two options. Improve it with your own efforts or leave, but she and the children remain. He crashed on his dad's couch for a few nights before his dad got tired of it and kicked him out, telling him to be a man and go back to his family. He returned home, but was sullen and often lashed out at his children. Heather was almost at her breaking point, and suddenly things got worse. Angie fired him. It almost killed her, and she spent many nights clinging to me and crying herself to sleep. She began to trust him, and he made great progress in the position she gave him, but he still harbored resentment and wanted to return to California. Heather wasn't keen on the idea. Why would we do this? I already uprooted this family once and started again. I don't want to do this anymore. She sighed. You need to think about this. You're making more now than you did in your best year in California, and unless you've turned into a screaming idiot, you should realize that both of your parents are hoping you'll take over the business in a few years. I have have a job that I really love. We don't have a mortgage. We don't have car loans. We basically just have living expenses, and we live pretty well, though. The kids absolutely adore this place adore your mother and think both grandfathers could change the world if they wanted to. Think about how they would feel if we left. They only have one grandfather, the other one is just a loser, with whom my mother lives. Heather hit him, strongly. Don't you dare say that to me again, not in this life. If you haven't noticed, we live rent-free in a loser house. I drove the car he got for me, and if I picked up the phone and said I need whatever it was, it would appear right away. Lynette told me the other day that she will build houses when she grows up like Grandpa. I think Jeremiah will be the next business tycoon. He likes to go to the office with Grandpa Benny. We have a very bright future here, dear. 
He thought about it for a few days, and then used his job to gain access to company funds and borrowed $200,000 to invest in the scheme he originally wanted. The plan was to invest the money, make a fortune, pay the money back, and let the profits run until he saved enough to move back to California in style. This failed when there was no profit and the scheme failed, leaving many investors in debt. Accountants discovered this three weeks later. Angie fainted when she found out, and her assistant called me and Benny. They called an ambulance, and she was taken to hospital for observation. We met in the emergency room. The doctor told us that they were treating her for severe shock and wanted to keep her overnight. Benny and I walked down the hallway for four hours, and he only left when his new girlfriend came to pick him up. She was still a young model, but only eight years younger. She didn't let him relax too much, she kept him on his toes, and her grandchildren adored her. He didn't admit it, but he was so in love with her that he didn't see anything around him. He told me one day, while we were grilling, that he was tired of living in a condo and was looking for a home. Vicky actively helped him, just as a woman's opinion, he explained. In fact, he said he would buy the one she chose. The thought flashed through my mind that he would get married before me, and I felt sad. I never stayed in the hospital, sleeping on a chair next to her bed. She woke up around three, and I spent another two hours holding her while she cried before the morning shift came in and gave her another sedative. She was discharged that same day, and Heather was there to take her home. As they walked her out in the stroller, Heather noticed how fragile she looked and burst into tears. I ended up driving the car while they sat in the back, hugging each other. We got her settled in the house, and Heather told me what was going on in her world. He left, Dad. I came home and the bedroom was trashed. He gathered as many clothes as he could and disappeared. I don't know if he'll come back. She started calling Angie mom after six months. Her parents moved to Portugal, and if she was lucky, she saw them every four years, so we became mom and dad, the ones to go to with a problem. She smiled when she called me daddy for the first time. I call Angie mom and you're the best dad I've ever known, so if you have no objections, it's dad. I had no objections. Heather checked the bank accounts and he emptied them. There was quite a significant amount in the savings account. She once told me that sooner or later I would probably kick them out and they needed an escape plan. Angie told me that they were actually saving for a down payment on the house I would build for them on an acre of her land. Heather was furious and spent most of the week staying with us. The children were happy, but in the end they wanted to return home. Two weeks later, Angie was so angry that she activated the GPS in his car, a car that belonged to her company. According to the app, he was in a small town in Texas. Benny and I flew out to find him. We found him in a small bar, surrounded by regulars who listened to him talk about what a great businessman he was. As long as he bought drinks, they agreed with him. Benny patted him on the shoulder. Son, it's time to come home. He turned on the bar stool, eyes widening. Then he saw me. Come to gloat, you bastard. You took my family away from me, you bastard. I almost felt sick every time Heather said Reggie did it, or you should see what Reggie got for the kids. Then he turned to his father. And you, you just stood there and let him take everything. What kind of man are you? Benny looked at him for a long time. Do you know what Reggie took from me? Nothing. Everything I had, I threw away myself long before I heard his name. It took me a while to pull my head out of my ass, but I did it. Now I'm closer to your mother than when we were married. She is now a friend, and for a long time I had no friends. But you know what? This isn't about Reggie, or your mother, or even me. This is about you and what you did. Now be a man, get off that chair, and come home to face the consequences. I didn't have time to react when he jumped from the chair and hit my father. He stood smiling, swaying a little. Would you like to try it, old man? I smiled. Yes, I really do. I'd like to say it was an epic fight, and we fought all over the bar until we went outside to continue, but it wasn't. The younger one knew nothing about fighting. I knew. My father was an amateur champion as a Golden Gloves boxer in his teens, 
and was on an elite boxing team while serving in the Navy. The military gave him a new understanding of fighting, and he passed it on to me. I didn't box, but I did wrestle in college, and he did it for me just in case. This came in handy at the beginning of my construction career. Sometimes you can't just reach an agreement with a guy. Sometimes you need to make a statement. With the youngest, I felt like I needed to make a statement. He ya made it. I could have done this all day, but the deputy tapped me on the shoulder. We can stop. We'll take it upon ourselves. The bartender called when he knocked his father out. Another sheriff's deputy pulled Junior onto the bar to handcuff him while medics checked Benny. He took a pretty serious hit and was sent to a local hospital to be evaluated for a concussion. We didn't have to press charges. The bartender and police officers happily did it for us. Disorderly conduct, damage to personal property, two counts of assault, and one count of assault on a lawman when he kicked a sheriff's deputy while he was handcuffing him. Bail was set at $25,000, and neither Benny nor I wanted to pay it. He spent three weeks in jail before he had his first hearing. On the advice of a public defender, he pleaded guilty to lesser offenses, was found guilty, sentenced to a year in prison, and released on time served in custody and on probation. He also had to pay damages to the bartender for the chair and pay a fine of $5,000. Angie flew out and paid for it, on the condition that the state would allow him to serve his probation at home. It effectively imprisoned him, which didn't help his mood. Three weeks after he returned home, Heather asked him to leave. You are no longer the man I married. Why aren't you happy? You had everything, and you were too stupid to appreciate it. They were at home, and the children were with us. He swung at her, but she laughed in his face. Go ahead, but as soon as you stop hitting, you better start running. Daddy will come for you, even if he has to look to the ends of the earth for you, and I would love to be there when he finds you. He left after three hours, but came back two days later, because Angie called and said if his ass wasn't home by the time he had to check in with his parole officer, he was on his own. Benny had found a house by then and allowed him to live in his condo until the deal was completed. Heather wasn't kidding, and when she filed for divorce and asked for temporary child support, he was furious. Angie made it clear that he could no longer work for the company and he was left without a job. If he doesn't find a job soon, he will violate the terms of his probation. I thought about the whole situation while Heather cried on my shoulder and Angie comforted her on the other side. Angie was depressed for almost two months, Heather's nerves were on edge, and even the children began to feel the tension. This made them even more attached to us. After we put Heather to bed, I told Angie that I needed to go out. Leave. Now. It's too late. It won't take long. I hope you won't be wrapped in a blanket when I get back. Angie was a well-known quilt lover. Often I would wake up and she would be wrapped in them like a cocoon. I tried several times and started keeping a spare blanket by the bed. She always apologized the next morning, but it was hard to keep the smile on her face. Should I get a hot water bottle? I won't be long and I'll snuggle up to you until you purr like a kitten when I get back. She just kissed me and turned over falling asleep before I could even get into the car. I drove straight to Benny's condo and started knocking on the door. The younger one opened it a little, saw me, and tried to slam it shut. I kicked it so hard that he was thrown back. I closed the door and sat in the chair while he tried to get up. If you want to hit, hit. There's no one here to save you, and I'll beat you to pulp and take pleasure in it. I'll call the police. Try it. I'll pounce on you before you can hit nine. We're going to talk about your future. Let's recap a bit first. You went broke in California and came home. Your mother was ecstatic, already planning her retirement in a few years, and gave you quite a responsible position. We gave you a place to live, cars to drive, and looked after the children as often as you allowed. You had to think that you had died and gone to heaven. Heather said that this was her happiest time. Marriage. You literally fell into a fire and found yourself not burning. Was that enough? Hell no, so you stole from your parents and got involved in some stupid scheme to prove that you're smarter than the rest of us, when in fact you were the dumbest son of a bitch on the East Coast. 
You threw away a successful company that was worth more than you could have ever accumulated in your entire life. It seems like you gave up on a woman worth three others you can find, and two really. Wonderful children. Does that sum it all up? So, having said that, what do you want, Junior? What do you need to be happy? The unhappiness of everyone around you. If that's your goal, you can do it. This is a one-time offer. Refuse and I'll leave. Just so you know, a woman like Heather will not be lonely for a long time. Even with two children, some good person will understand how valuable she is and will make it his life goal to achieve her love. Maybe you want to go to prison. That would be a real discovery for you. I'll tell you, boy, you're a coward, and there's nothing prisoners love more than fresh meat. I was on the rise, releasing things I had been holding inside out of love for his family, but now it was time to take the gloves off. I walked around the room while he sat on the sofa and trembled. Finally, I stopped in front of him. Well, what are you going to do? Are you going to become a man, or are you going to prove that you really are a coward? Well, damn, he started crying. I thought it was funny and sat down until he cried. I don't have a job and no one in this area will touch me. I can't leave the state or I'll be violating my probation. If I don't get a job soon, I'll be violating. If I even get a parking ticket, I'll be violating. I'll never get my family back. My parents despise me and you must be enjoying it. I hit him. Done complaining? I'm going to do something for you, even if it pisses me off. I assure you, I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for the family I love. I threw one of my business cards. Be at this address on Monday at 8. If you don't show up, I'll wash my hands of you. Don't wear a suit. It might not be necessary for long, if at all. Wear some sturdy jeans, good boots, and a work shirt. You've just entered the construction business. You will work like an ox, and you will not complain, whine, or cry. You will become a man, and you will do what they say. I will find out if you don't. I headed towards the door. By the way, 25% of your salary will be withheld and sent to Heather each week. You still have kids to support, and if you have any hope of getting your family back, this is a good place to start. I wondered, driving home, if anything I said connected. We'll see on Monday. I grinned when I saw Angie wrapped up like a mummy. I told her one day that she must have been a lizard in a past life because I had never met such a cold-blooded person. She simply smiled. Lizards love to lie on warm rocks. I understand that. I like to lie cuddled up to a man who keeps me warm. No one was more surprised than me to see him in the office on Monday. I assigned him to the field crew and told the supervisor and foreman not to coddle him, but to be lenient. Give him a chance. He's got a lot on the line. I later found out that he cried on the first day because his body hurt so much. The next day he could barely function, but he came. After a month, his body got used to it, and he had real muscles for the first time in his life. He was tried out for a variety of jobs and seemed to have a real affinity for installing and finishing drywall. Sometimes I would see him from my office, emerging from his work van, looking like a ghost covered in drywall dust. Heather moved to a position on the payroll, and she saw his name and his first paycheck. Then the alimony ended up in her account. She burst into my office. Is this your business, Dad? Someone had to give him a job, and I didn't want you to have to take the kids to prison on a date. I paid him a visit and asked him nicely. I bet you. You probably beat him to a pulp and forced him to show up. I didn't do anything like that. If he didn't, that means he was more afraid of you than I thought. Do you think he'll last? Time will tell, girl. Now go pick up the kids from daycare so I can get my goodbye kisses. Only if the big girl can kiss him first. They crossed paths in the corridors from time to time and barely spoke. Then one day he begged her to let him have lunch with the children on the picnic tables outside the kindergarten. She almost disagreed, strictly explaining to him how to behave. She decided to have lunch with them to make sure everything would be okay. Everything was going well until Linny climbed onto his lap and showed him the little helmet I had given her. Look, Dad, I also have a helmet. We will both be builders like Grandpa.
Large tears streamed down his cheeks as he hugged her, and then Jeremiah, turning to thank Heather in a shaky voice for her kindness. Tears also flowed down her cheeks. He tried, if he worked nearby, to come for lunch as often as possible. He always asked Heather to have lunch with them if she had time. She found time. He left his father's townhouse and rented a small studio next to his office. I let him drive one of the company cars, and he was very careful to use it only when necessary. It was a four-door model so he could take the kids when Heather allowed. Six months passed, and Heather walked into my office and closed the door. Dad, can I talk to you? Of course, dear. What's on your mind? Benny. I knew she meant her Benny, so I nodded. We've talked a lot lately. He comes to our house for dinner at least twice a week. He's changing, I see it. I need to ask a favor. He really wants to talk to his parents. Can I bring him on Sunday? His parents have already disowned him. Angie didn't know I gave him the job, and I tried not to bring it up in conversation. I alerted Heather, and she just said in passing that he got a new job and was paying child support. Let me talk to your mother first. I won't ambush her. I'll see which way the wind blows and let you know. Angie and Benny were not eager to date, but agreed for the sake of Heather and the children. He came looking scared to death. Children crowded around him, showing off the new pool with a water slide and chattering incessantly. We left them alone, and after dinner he asked his parents to talk to him. I picked up the kids and Heather, and we went out for ice cream, returning forty-five minutes later. He left. Angie had tears in her eyes, and Benny looked a little worried. He apologized, and I think sincerely. He swore that he would return the money to us, but we told him that if he really felt that way, then he should use the money for the benefit of the children. We made it clear that we could never let him work for us again, or at least not until enough time had passed for us to trust in his reliability. He said that he did not expect such forgiveness and would never let us down again. I hope he is sincere. Angie surprised me with her determination. I listened to him and then said that words are easy. If he wants our forgiveness, our respect, he needs to start earning it, both from us and in his family. Benny has a lot of mistakes to overcome, and I hope he gets through it. Later, when we were cuddling in bed, she surprised me with a couple more details. He only said good things about you. You really impressed him, and you might be his role model now. And then, to my surprise, he gave me advice. He told me I should put your ring on and stop procrastinating. If I'm so afraid of a permanent commitment, maybe I should let you go so you can find someone else. I'm starting to like this guy. She pushed me. Shut up. This is serious. Yes, this is serious, and since we're talking about it, do you ever intend to marry me? She froze and I sighed, turning my back to her. A few seconds later she pressed herself against me. Honey, I was so scared. You don't know this, but when Ben was younger, he looked a lot like him. I put up with things I shouldn't have put up with for years. I still sometimes have nightmares about the kind of person I was then. I swore that I would never let that happen again, that I would never let a man have that kind of power over me again. I wanted to get up, but she held me tightly. I'll leave tomorrow. I never saw her hit me, but it was a serious blow. You won't leave. What I'm trying to tell you is that I have changed. You have more power over me now than anyone in my life. Your smile, your touch, the way you light up when you've done something special for me and you see that I like it, the way you almost glow when Heather brings the kids, I started living for it. So, in the most clumsy way, I'm telling you that if you ask a certain question, you might like the answer this time. I could imagine her holding her breath, and I shrugged. Let me think. I'll tell you tomorrow, Monday, at the latest. She tensed, and I heard her take a deep breath. I quickly turned over and covered her with kisses. When I let her go, I jumped out of bed. Stay here. It's a good thing Heather and the kids weren't here, otherwise they might have seen me in the light of the full moon as I rushed past the window naked. I ran into the garden shed and found box after bag of bone meal. I knew that if I hid it there, she would never find it. Angie was deathly afraid of spiders, 
once saw a writing spider on the wall and never went into the building again unless I was with her. She sat in bed, hugging her knees with her arms. She looked like a teenager, not a woman with two grandchildren. I crawled to the bed and jumped on it, wrapping it in a blanket. Then I kissed her until she calmed down. Honey, I have something for you. There's a secret word you have to say to get it. Want to see? She nodded and I smiled, showing her the box and opening it. I knew she would never have chosen this particular ring, but it seemed perfect to me and she still didn't pay for it. Her eyes widened and she tried to get out from under the blanket. You don't want him? I thought you'd like it. I can always return it. By then her left hand was already outstretched and she was tapping my chest. Give it to me. No, no, you didn't say the magic word. Do you want to try again? You are disgusting. Yes, fine. Yes, with all my heart I am ready to become Mrs. Reginald Wilkes. Having said that, I believe that you have something that belongs to me, something that I will treasure for the rest of my life. Now give it back. I made her kiss me first, and then gently placed the symbol of my love on her graceful finger. She sighed. Then she hugged me and cried. I hugged her and cried. When we finished crying, we started kissing. Five minutes later, she jumped out of bed and grabbed her phone. I need to call Heather and Vicky, Barb, Alice, and... I gently took the phone from her. You cannot. Why? Because it's 1.30 am. They'll all be excited about the news, but not as excited as they would be if you called them now. Let's go back to bed. This time she swept me off my feet and into bed. I laughed. State award for best grandmother of the year, two years in a row and still undefeated. This thought flashed through my mind as she hugged me. I was 48 at the time and she was 54. She sometimes reminded me that she was only six and a half years older, but it felt like there were two teenagers in bed that night. We didn't wake up until nine when Heather came to see us. Angie staggered out of bed, opened the door, and instead of speaking, simply stuck her hand with the ring in Heather's face. Heather then screamed, which caused a similar reaction from Angie, and I got up and started making coffee. I was in the middle of preparing breakfast when they calmed down and were able to speak coherently. As soon as they ate, the phones appeared in their hands again. I hurried away, called Ben, and we went to the boat. I told him about the night before while we were fishing from a specially designed platform, and after he caught a bass he grinned and held out his hand. Congratulations, you won a wonderful woman. However, if you ever treat her like I do, well, I can't punch you in the face, but I'm a great shot. Keep your guns in the safe. I think I can handle it. He called from the boat to congratulate her. He hung up laughing. I'm going to be your best man, Heather and Vicky are going to be bridesmaids, and although they're a little old for it, Jeer and Linny are going to be ring bearers and flower girls. Do you think you can survive until the wedding is over? I can handle it with my teeth gritted. Sixteen years later, Angie and I, along with Ben and Vicky, watched with pride as Lynetta received her master's degree in construction management and engineering a double major completed simultaneously. Her management thesis was called Building a Box. She used part of her thesis for her speech at the ceremony. She described her journey from the time she was nine and built her own jewelry box with hinges and a handle. She still keeps it. She then explained how she built a birdhouse, then a doghouse, then a playhouse, several small sheds, and finally designed and built a summer house that she designed in her spare time. It was built for a family. My grandfather Wilkes taught me how to build, guiding me from the box to the bungalow. He taught me that every building is basically a box. They just get bigger and more complex, so you need to build the best box you can. Then my grandfather Ben Bassett SR taught me how to build business relationships, how to always deal fairly and keep your word, and if you do that, you will always be successful, whether you make money or not. I have found this to be true for any relationship as well. You build a strong box and eliminate any weaknesses or shortcomings you find. My grandparents and mother always made sure my box was strong. When I get married and start my life with another person, rest assured that the box will be built around our love 
and there will be no weaknesses in it. It was very touching. So why didn't she thank her father in her speech? He returned a few months after the first family dinner, and it took another month before they started sleeping together again. I made him a foreman because he deserved it, and after a year it seemed like they had overcome their problems. One day he simply disappeared. Without warning, he did not show up for work, packed his belongings into a truck and left. He left a brief note saying he was moving back to California, that he was sorry, and that he would be sending child support. Heather was devastated again. We had to send her and the kids to therapy to deal with the abandonment. Ben and I stepped forward to try to fill the void, and that helped a little. Of course, we hired detectives to find him, and they found him two months later. He worked for a construction company as a subcontractor on a large apartment building project and lived with one of his old girlfriends. It turned out she was the reason he wanted to move back to the West Coast. She left and got married when he returned home. It didn't last even a year. They kept in touch via email on an account Heather didn't know about, and when she told him she was single again and really missed him, he left the next day. Heather cried a little and then moved on with her life. She didn't have the luxury of riding off into the sunset, leaving her children behind. She filed for divorce three months after he left and served him with the papers at his workplace. There was a clause in the documents about the payment of alimony, but she gave him a way out. Sign a waiver of parental rights and you are free. His new woman was unhappy that he would have to give up so much of his income and pressured him until he signed. Two years later, Heather was the deputy head of payroll and human resources, where she had to deal with every employee in some capacity. I sent her to study to finish her degree, allowing her to work half a day to attend classes. She returned full-time with alacrity, storming into my office and jumping into my lap. Why are you so kind to me? I never told you, but my first wife was a selfish woman and lied to me about her ability to have children. She resisted adoption, and after we broke up it was revealed that she had the procedure done to avoid pregnancy. I was doomed to be a dead end, biologically, to die unloved and unattached, and then I met Angie. I knew we could never have children, but her love was more important to me. Then you showed up and gave me a second chance. You and the kids were in my heart from the first day off, and my feelings only grew stronger. Heather, you are the closest thing to a daughter I have ever had, which is why I decided to adopt you. Not in a legal sense, you're too old for that, but in an emotional sense, and as my daughter, that automatically makes you my heir. That's why I insisted on you getting your degree. When I retire, my share of the business will pass to you. I've spoken to Sarah and David about this, and they think it's a good idea to keep the business in the family. The paperwork is ready, and all you have to do is accept the challenge when I leave. She got so emotional that I had to call Angie to calm her down. She stroked her until she stopped sobbing and smiling. You really didn't see this coming? You were his pride and joy from the very beginning. Almost no one had any idea about this. Almost everyone will be very happy for you. Then David's son came over to fill out the insurance paperwork and met Heather. Sparks flew, and 15 months later, I had the honor of walking her down the aisle. Talk about keeping the business in the family. Sarah was David's sister, and her son was a military man, so Heather and David Jr. J. inherited everything. By then they were in their thirties, and to no one's surprise they had a son, whom they named David Reginald. Heather warned us. My, you have older children almost all the time, let me be with this. It was really difficult, but we stuck it out. Jeremiah followed in Benny's footsteps, working summers and between studies at the company while both grandfathers mentored him. Linetta did the same at my company. She even worked with construction crews for two summers before moving into the office to learn from her mother and Sarah. Jeremiah completed his business degree, and after two years it became clear that he would be running the family business within a few years. His grandfathers couldn't wait. By the time Lynette received her degrees, Angie was 70 and I was 64. Angie had retired three years earlier, and this would be my last year before Heather took over. We planned to stay active, travel, and watch the next generation. Jeremiah was already married, had a little son, 
and a second one was on the way. Lynette wasn't ready to settle down yet, but we knew it was a matter of time before someone saw her worth and won her love. Fourteen years after his passing, we received notice that Benny Jr. had died in a construction accident. He was attempting to unload a full 14 by 4 and a half foot stack of drywall, 32 sheets, using an electric hoist. Safety regulations required the use of two winches at the same time with the presence of an observer, but he was in a hurry. As the weight rose nine feet into the air, the weight shifted and everything collapsed on top of it. According to the incident report, he was crushed on impact. We didn't receive notice until three weeks after the funeral, when the state was sorting through paperwork to find next of kin. It turned out that his new wife left three years ago, leaving him with two daughters to look after. The mother could not be found, and California wanted to know what to do with them. Ben, Vicky, Angie, and I all immediately flew out there. The kids were both girls, one eleven and the other nine, and they were the rudest, most disrespectful kids I've ever met. The older one snapped at us. If you are our grandparents, why have we never seen you, huh? Because until a few days ago, we didn't know about your existence. If you did, you would know a lot more about us now. I'm not going anywhere with you. Angie and Vicky were in tears, so I took the lead. If they don't find your mother, you may have no choice. Whether it's about rich grandparents taking you in or leaving you in foster care and paying for your upbringing, the state will think about itself. I suggest you, if you have nothing important that is keeping you here, if they don't find your mother, come with us and see how we are doing. Think about it. The older one looked defiant, but the younger one was just scared, so I turned to her. What about you, princess? New clothes, a big house, an older brother and sister who will look after you if needed and tell you that I can be a great grandfather. I have recommendations if you're interested. Ben chimed in, saying that we sometimes compete to see who spoils the grandkids the most, and then we walked away and let the women talk to them. Angie finally made her way to them, showing them pictures of the older siblings, noting how much they looked alike, and how we had plenty of space in every home, showing them pictures including the outdoor kitchen and pool, as well as several of our boats. Ben and Vicky bought themselves a lightweight pleasure boat as a retirement gift, but we were still using the larger boat, our third, when everyone wanted to go for a spin. The house that Vicky chose was in the village and had a small plot. They had several animals, including three horses. We didn't feel inclined to ride horses, but Jeer and Linny loved it, so they were there as often as we were. Despite the enormous effort of spoiling them, we also balanced it out with life lessons, and they turned out to be fairly well-adjusted young adults. Angie hit on the youngest, Vanessa. I've never ridden a horse. Vicky smiled. She, like me, had never had children, and this was a golden opportunity for her. Come home with us, baby. I'll teach you how to skate very fast. Charlie was passionate about boats. I've never fished. Well, if you come home with us, you'll spend so much time on the water that you'll feel like a duck. We stayed there for two weeks while they searched for their mother. We took advantage of this and got permission to travel, so we visited an amusement park, a ranch where we rode horses for the first time, but mostly just spent time with them, convincing them that we were not monsters who eat children for breakfast. Vanessa became attached to Ben and Vicky, and Charlie seemed to like us more. They ended up coming home with us, and since Vanessa insisted, they moved in with Ben and Vicky. Charlie went with them, too. We were a little disappointed, but we understood that they would need help, and we usually took them for the weekend. The first year was difficult as we had to break some bad habits, but by the end of the second year they relaxed, felt safe and loved, calmed down and became part of the family. Heather and her husband mentored them, and Jeer wanted them to spend time with him and his wife, a woman he met at work. They dated for a year before he took her to a picnic, scared to death because she was Indian. None of us knew where it came from, and we accepted it with open arms. She cemented her place in the family when she began bringing food to picnics. One day she brought out a huge pot of curry, and we ate it all, ignoring the steaks and chicken. He told his younger sisters that they would use them as training tools when they had children of their own. 
They were so enamored with Mary, her Americanized name, that they insisted on a sorry for the wedding of one of her friends. Photos take pride of place on our wall. I think they helped us stay young. Angie lived to see Vanessa's graduation from school, but this was her last public appearance. She was almost 80 when she fell and broke her hip, dying of complications two weeks later. It was sudden and left me devastated, but after six months of mourning, I came to the realization that we had a pretty good life. Since we met, we have never been with anyone else. No dating, no flings, no other relationships, we just connected and never let go. Even for a second marriage, this was unusual. Every night I looked at the sign I made for her a couple of years after we got married. It was an award plaque that proudly proclaimed, Hottest Granny of the Year, with our state's name and date in a small inset at the bottom. Every year I would take it to the reward store where I bought it and add a new insert with the current year. When Linetta gave birth to her first child, I made a new sign that said, Hottest Great Grandma of the Year, and started adding inserts. She giggled every time I added a year and blushed when Vanessa once asked her what gilf meant. I said it meant grandmother I'll love forever, and her face lit up even brighter. I discussed this with Angie, and we agreed that if Vanessa didn't already have a home, she would get ours. Ben and Vicky agreed that Charlie would have them. The following year, Ben died in his sleep. I hugged Vicky and took charge of all the necessary preparations. I developed a habit of staying with her a couple of times a week to make sure she was okay, and after a year she moved in with me. We weren't romantically involved, although we loved each other as friends, we were just two older people who didn't want to be alone. The kids kept grinning, and I was sure that Angie and Ben were laughing somewhere in heaven. Sometimes we sat on the porch in rocking chairs, watching the sunset and reminiscing about our departed loved ones, and we both agreed that no matter how our lives began, our golden years were shining ones, and we were very lucky with who we chose for love. One night we talked until dark about everything, and when I got up to go inside, she said she wanted to sit a little longer, enjoying the coolness. I left her for 45 minutes, thinking about the tears in her eyes, and decided to bring her a blanket if she stayed, or help her in if she was ready. It seemed like she would never need a blanket again. She died, still warm, with a smile on her face. I'm sure at that moment she and Ben were hugging and Angie was smiling. I sat next to her and waited for the ambulance, talking to her. Vicky, maybe it happened a little late, but you got what you dreamed of. A good person to love, children surrounded by a big family that loved you for who you were. Not many people can say that when they leave this life. If you can hear me, please pass on the message to Angie. Tell her I'll be there soon with a new sign. She'll say, the hottest great-grandmother in all of eternity, and it'll be the absolute truth. Paramedics arrived, and I kissed her on the cheek, wishing her a safe journey, before they carefully laid her on the stretcher. Sighing, I started making calls, knowing that the house would soon be full of people. I thought about the girls who stopped calling her grandma after less than a year and started calling her mom. She told us that it was the second most important moment in her life, after her wedding to Ben. They will be devastated, and we will have to be strong for them. To be honest, I didn't know how much strength I had left. I looked at the stars and smiled. Soon, darling, soon. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one.